Good morning, friends. I am up here by the barn and the roosters are having a competition, a crowing competition. Um, but first thing when I get up, I came to check these meat birds because we just moved them outside yesterday and we put some new wire on the chicken house. So that was the first thing on my list was come check the meat birds and make sure no predators got in. Um, the donkeys are also up here. They were locked up here overnight um, because they do protect against some predators too. So we are going to head to the garden. So I'm gonna take you um, around the front of the house. So this is our front entry and that there in front of the garage is where I do my canning, my camp chef and my um, outdoor cooking space is there. It's nothing fancy for an outdoor cooking space, just a camp chef and a table and some old fashioned twin tubs and a hose. Um, but I'm gonna walk to the garden this way and show you my flower garden on the way to the vegetable garden. So this area here, we all backfilled to try to keep water out of our basement. Um, so there's a lot of clay mixed in here. So this doesn't do quite as well as some. I've been really working on amending the soil um, and it's getting there. It's just a little pokey. So that is east and that is the sunrise. And this is west. I've got this big yellow lily that has burst into bloom this week. This is around the front of the house facing towards the west. I put some cannonballs in there because my hardy hibiscus did not come back this spring. Um, so I kind of filled up that space with cannonballs. Got some dark red lilies coming out from under my old-fashioned rose bush. I put a few zinnias in the air. There's a hydrangea bush. So this is the front of the house, nothing fancy. And that is where the garden is. So when I go to and from the garden, from the house, I'm usually exiting one, either the sliding door there from the dining room or the laundry room door over there. Back here against the house, I have my peppermint plants. And then over there, I just have some um, comfrey and yarrow and things like that. Okay, we are in the garden and we've had a couple things happen in the garden. Um, I was gone for four days and one of those days actually nights the cows got out and they went straight for my sweet corn <laughs> and if you are around sweet corn when it's tasseling um, and forming cobs like once the silk comes out of the cob you can smell it you can smell it for a long ways here in Iowa, when the field corn, like the acres and acres of corn, is in the sweet corn stage, like where the silk is just pushing out, you can smell it like the whole world around here smells like sweet corn. But anyway, that's what my cows were smelling and that's what they went for. So they knocked down a bunch of my sweet corn. Um, but it'll be okay. I think they were discovered and chased back in before they did too much damage. But you can see here, here's where a cow got in. And you can tell my sweet corn is clearly taller than I am now. And that is with it being um, blown down in that storm we had a couple weeks ago. But it all stood back up again. So all those jiggly little things are dropping pollen. 
and I don't really see a lot of pollen yet, but what happens is the pollen lands on the silk. And the silk, the silk is very sticky at this stage. And then the silk, that, that's called pollination. Each of these tiny little hairs is connected to a spot on the cob and when it gets pollinated, that's what forms a kernel. So that is the stage we're at. We're at the beautiful mermaid stage of the sweet corn. Um, I think here you can see some pollen that's falling down. You can feel the pollen. Anyway, that, so what I'll see next is I'll see these, the cobs getting real fat um, because those kernels take up more room. Um, and then once the, the silk turns brown and old, I will know it's time to start looking um, at harvesting it. So in their journey to my garden and through my garden, the cows broke off two um, pepper plants and <laughs> So by the time yesterday when I came to the garden, when I came home um, 2 a.m. the night before, I came down and there was a pepper plant that was fallen over, but it hadn't wilted yet. And it had four nice peppers on. So we harvested those and we made some pepper cabbage, harvesting the cabbage. And that will be in Saturday's video. And the other pepper plant was wilted and the peppers were wilted, so we had to throw those out. Um, but I did have a question. How do you know when it's time to harvest peppers? So I'm going to show you how I know when it's time to harvest peppers. So here is a pepper that I could harvest. The bec and the reason I know this is because it's real hard. The side walls are real solid and real hard. Compared to like say this one is still real soft. You can see how it's a little flexible there. But when the side walls are real solid, you know it's time to, that it's ripe. Now, you don't have to harvest a pepper as soon as it's ripe. I'll just leave those until I'm ready to use them. Um, I'll either use them in my you know day-to-day -day cooking or I'll wait until I'm ready to make salsa and then I'll harvest them. Because peppers are okay, just stay in there on their plant they don't rot or, you know, anything like that unless they're overwatered and hanging on the ground. Um, so the peppers are something that you can just leave. You just let it there until you're ready to use it for the most part. Like as a pepper matures, they will turn yellow or orange. Some varieties, not every variety, some varieties will, and then you can still use them then. So we harvested most of our cabbage and I wanted to show you something. On one of my earlier videos, I said that um, cabbage has to come out because it doesn't you know, reproduce after you harvest it. But apparently it actually does. Oh, that one I need to use as um, weed control. I'll use this one and use all its leaves to keep weeds down. There's some more tiny baby cabbages. They're not real hard yet, so I'm just going to let them and see what happens. Um, here's all the broccoli that didn't get harvested while I was gone. So I'm going to cut all those off. And I probably won't use them because they're already too loose. We kind of like them when they're real tight like this one. Um, so I'll probably just cut them, cut them all off and give them to the pigs and then the broccoli plant will send out more shoots. I did harvest some from this plant that we will eat. And up here, you can see this is where my cauliflower was. So I've harvested most of the cauliflower. We've eaten it and put it in the freezer. And then I'm just using the leaves as weed control and it'll compost down into the soil and I'm not gonna plant anything there because the watermelons here will take over that spot. So I like to put my watermelons next to my brassicas because by the time my brassicas come out, 
um, the watermelons are ready for that space. Looks like I have another cauliflower down there. It's been a beautiful spring for cauliflower and broccoli. And I spied this last night when I was weeding a tiny baby watermelon. I've got some hot peppers coming on. This is a lettuce that's going to seed. I don't know if it's gonna make it because it kind of looks like it's rotting down here. So we'll leave it and see what happens. There's my hot peppers coming on. I will mostly use those for making salsa and maybe some cowboy candy. Um, the raspberries are done. We are gonna have a few late ones coming on. Those will be just enough for a snack. The onions are all <laughs> ready for salsa making. Um, and you can tell the, the purple ones must have a shorter uh, maturity date because the purple ones are on this side and those have almost all fallen over, um, which means they are mature. So I'll harvest them sometime in the next week or two, um, but there's really no hurry for them. They'll be fine in the garden as long as we don't get too much rain. So when I harvest my onions, I will show um, what I do. Um, but really you don't have to harvest them as soon as they fall over. I mostly just leave mine in the garden until I'm ready to get them out. Um, and sometimes that's fall when I harvest everything else and I don't need that space because of our short growing season. I'm not gonna use that space anyway. So they can just sit and dry out there. Um, but I never harvest them before the tops have all fallen over because that is a sign that they are mature. Um, which brings me to the question, one of the questions that I get asked a lot or a comment is how fast our things grow um, and how we planted later than some areas, but we're already ahead of them in our harvest. Um, and what happens, the way that works is we are further north. So we are in the northern, far northern hemisphere. So our latitude lines, if you imagine the latitude lines around the earth, are not near as long as the ones around the center of the earth. So we're tilted closer to the sun in the summer and then farther away in the winter too. But um, because we're tilted closer to the sun in the summer, we accumulate more daylight hours. And on your seed packet, when it says days to maturity, um, they are counting the average daylight hour in probably in the world. And we get more than the average. So, you know, say the daylight hour, the average is eight hours. I mean, 12 hours is what I meant to say in June. Say the, you know, the average is 12 and we are accumulating 15 hours of daylight. That means for every week, we are accumulating a whole day's worth of daylight compared to someone that's just getting 12 hours and if we're getting 15 hours. So every week, if we gain a day, we're gonna catch up with somebody that you know in a month's time we're going to catch up with somebody that planted their crops a whole month before we did um but it's a beautiful design of god because we also have a frost date of september 15th so our crops better hurry up or we won't get anything so often when you see that i don't um put another crop in is because my i have very limited options for fall crops um, my, okay, so talking about our frost date being September 15th, my tomatoes, they're beautiful. They're taller than I am and they're beautiful. I don't see any signs of blight, but guys, I don't have any tomatoes turning red yet. I need, I'm getting a little anxious because I put up like a hundred or more quarts of tomato products. 
so I'm getting a little nervous because I really want to start filling up that tomato shelf in my cold room with jars of tomato things. They're just not turning. Um, part two things. They're not mature enough and the blossoms, tomato blossoms don't set if the nighttime temperatures are too cold. So probably a month ago or two we had you know cold cold nights and that caused the tomato plants to abort their blossoms so then that delays um us having ripe tomatoes because the they're the tomatoes have just not set they've not been formed long enough to be mature um so yeah we're two weeks out from the fourth of july <clears throat> and we still don't have red tomatoes but it is what it is. Maybe we'll have a real late frost and I'll still get a full tomato crop, but you can easily see they're taller than I am. It is time to spend some time down here and tie them all up again. Such is the life of a gardener. Some things, cauliflower, I harvested one that was bigger than my head yesterday. And at the same, and you know, as I have joy about that, I'm kind of anxious about my tomatoes, but it's gonna be what it's gonna be. While we're talking tomatoes, um, I got a question asking about blossom end rot. Blossom end rot is kind of a um, combination of two things. Number one, overwatering, and then the, the overwatering dilutes the minerals in the soil and then your plant has a calcium deficiency. So how would I amend that? I would um, watch your watering, don't overwater, and then I would get a fertilizer that is labeled just for tomatoes. I know Jax is a brand that has a tomato fertilizer and I would start fertilizing them. Um, here in our zone, we have one shot at tomatoes. If something is wrong with them, um, I'm not sure if you're going to fix it in time to get a full harvest. But um, in some areas, you you know, you still have two, three months to work with your tomato plants. So it's definitely worth um, working, you know, to, to help them recover. The other thing that happened while I was gone is I walked down here and I'm like, what is happening to my cucumber plants? doesn't look like bug, a bug or any blight or anything like that and then i remembered that i have a dog that loves cucumbers and last year she would just sit here and wait until i picked her one and feed it and then she you know i'd feed it to her and she'd go away and she'd eat it so i'm like i bet because i was gone she thought the garden was now abandoned and she could have whatever she wanted so sure enough I watched and she came down here. She was actually on the other side and she was standing up getting the cucumbers. She was after this cucumber all the way up here. So she kind of wrecked both sides of my cucumber trellis while I was gone. But hopefully now that I'm back, she will understand that this is my garden and she can't just come and get what she wants when she wants without permission. So that brings us to this part where we pulled the peas out. Oh, this was another casualty of the cows. Cows love sunflower leaves. So they took down this one and I'm just glad that they didn't get those. <laughs> so I really, really like those to be so tall. There's my cows down there now. Anyway, this is where we planted the green beans. And here is where I found a little bit of a different variety. So this here is a different variety and you can tell. Anyway, because the peas were here, we will put compost here on these green beans as soon as they are a little taller. So we'll put compost on and then we'll cover the soil with grass clippings and you can see that 
they pushed the green beans as they were growing, pushed some of the seed casings up through the ground. Let me see, where was that? Anyway, there it is. You can see that they pushed some of the seed casings all the way up. And this is just an empty seed casing. My potatoes are still looking wonderful. Um, I think we've gotten ahead of the potato beetles. Not positive, um, but we will start eating from them soon. So the potatoes that we have in the cold room from um, the grocery store, I think I'm gonna can those so that we can start eating our fresh potatoes because I'm so hungry for fresh potatoes sometimes and i had this question over on my instagram in a question box sometimes what happens um and i'd like to blame this on not healing your potatoes um but i'm not entirely sure that's fair sometimes what happens is your potatoes put all their energy into foliage and you get very little potatoes um but healing them and burying the, those bottom leaves, and I have a whole video on healing potatoes and the reason you do it. So if, this is for the question, this is for the person that asked that question. If you feel like your potatoes have just foliage and no potatoes, definitely wait until your potato plant is dead and then try again. Um, it may be that you're just too early, like you're trying to find potatoes too early. But we've had potatoes that, you know, are as tall as I am and, you know, that come all the way up here and very few um, potatoes underneath them. Like they, it seemed they put everything into foliage. And I think two things, the soil is so high in nitrogen. Like if I put them where there was compost, a lot of compost the year before, um, they tend to put, because nitrogen makes foliage. And in most cases, that's good. But when you're looking for a root crop, you don't necessarily need that much nitrogen. So hilling them and burying those bottom leaves will stimulate the plant to put down more roots rather than just, you know, grow more foliage. Japanese beetles and how I battle them in my garden. We don't have a lot of Japanese beetle pressure this year. Some years is worse than other years, um, but there's not too much this so I year. I some Japanese beetle pressure here. Like you can see, they've been here. I don't see them right now, but that's one of the things that I do when I come into the garden in the morning. I just have a little disposable solo cup with some dish soap and water in. <clears throat> and in the morning when things are wet with dew the Japanese beetles can't fly real well and they don't fly when you disturb them so I take that cup and I just knock all the Japanese beetles that I can find I just knock them all into that cup of soapy water and they drown and then I just set the cup down and when it starts stinking I get rid of it and get a, a new cup and put some dish soap and water in and that is how I battle them. I have battled them where I've picked off hundreds and hundreds each day. Um, and I've battled them where I find maybe, you know, 25 each day. Um, but no, I don't use the Japanese beetle traps because I'm afraid that'll attract more Japanese beetles to my yard. I've never used the Japanese beetle traps um, because I don't want them to live here. I don't want Japanese beetles to, you know, be attracted to anything. And I know they say you can put them downwind um, from your vegetable garden, things like that. But the wind here comes from every which way. And I don't want to rush around um, with the Japanese beetle traps. And, you know, I don't want any that didn't make it into the trap to live in the ground until next summer. So I'd rather just pick them off with soapy water and do it that way and do the best I can. So somebody on my Instagram asked to, for me to talk about the why behind our garden. 
And so I've grown up always knowing how to garden. I've always had a garden. I have not always been as committed and as dedicated as I am in the last probably four or five years. Um, number one, we still have five children living at home and I stay at home so I cook three meals a day. So we go through a lot of food. Um, number two, it is saving us money right now. We eat what we can grow and it's giving us a sense of security. Um, we don't worry about what the prices are doing at the grocery store, what's still gonna be available and what won't be available. We have, we're, we're accustomed to eating according to what is available. Um, not from the grocery store, but from our garden. So in the in years past, or how I managed when I had lots of little ones, my garden was more of a, I will grow what I can, and what we can't grow, I will buy at the grocery store, or I'll buy in bulk and can it. Um, so that's kind of how I approach gardening for all the years that I had babies and toddlers. But now since Harrison is six, I can be much more um, committed to my garden. And I think since 2020, my family has done wonderful in adjusting our diet according to what we can grow and raise here on the homestead. And an occasional treat here and there, things that we can't grow, like those big, beautiful Bing cherries um, and, you know, things like that. So I feel like the family's done wonderfully in being weaned off of eating, you know, depending on the grocery store for, for our meals. And just to keep us happy and keep a variety. Um, so yeah, I feel like they've done a very good job in not always asking for things that we don't grow but I do try to buy them a treat every once in a while. So the strawberries are doing wonderfully. I did some weeding last night. This is my new part of the strawberry bed where I put young plants in. And then up here is the original part with the older plants. They are very busy sending out runners and no, I don't clip runners. So here you can see this one sending out runners right there. And those are gonna take root and that will be next year's bearing plants right in there. Last weekend when, or the weekend before when my brothers were here, we were talking about strawberries and my one brother and my brother-in-law are strawberry farmers. And they were saying, you've got to water your strawberries. You cannot practice tough love with your perennial plants if you want to be successful. So like tough love being you don't water them because they'll put down deeper roots that way. Um, like with your, like we do with the annual plants where we're like, well, it doesn't look like there's any rain in the forecast, but that's okay. My soil's covered. I'm just gonna let them put their roots down but that doesn't work with your perennial plants because if the strawberries struggle now, that will directly affect next year's harvest because what they're doing now is preparing for next year's harvest of berries. And that's the same with my raspberry plants. If they struggle now, that is gonna affect next year's raspberry plants. So my brothers both kind of told me, you can't practice that tough love gardening with your strawberries. So I put the drip hose to them and watered them a little yesterday. And the condition of the plant, the health of the plant this fall is going to be a good indication of what my harvest will be like next spring. So now that I have readjusted my goal a little bit, I am babying my strawberries, not just forgetting about them, and because I really want them to um, look healthy and vibrant and vigorous this fall.
Well, I bet that brings me to about 30 minutes and the sun is up beautifully. It is time for me to head to the barn. Um, the cows are gonna be heading up there, so I gotta go wake up the kids. And we have to go do chores. But thank you for everybody. Thank you to everybody that watches these garden videos where I just walk around and I ramble about different things in my garden. It really does bless me. And I feel like you're all here with me and there's nothing I love more than a walk in the garden. Um, and I'm thankful that you're all willing to walk with me to my garden and let me show it off. 